All right, we're back for a retro review of The Wire, episode four, Old Cases. Let's talk about it. Ain't it obvious? I just got the check for depositing. 750 for the sound wave to get it processed. Won't stop till that shit weighing down my pockets. My main thing's still my main thing. She a blossom. When she eats the pain with the brain, she a doctor. She open up dinner thing thicker than the plot gets. Swear that shit is awesome. Sight for the optics. Young nigga on top. Nike's all I'm rocking. So that all they see is checks from where the head to where the socks fit. No logo on the bifocal. Flicking no road tips. Won't even show my face until all the shows book. Eat the cash in advance. Leave them all social. I'm the guy they chosen. Rise up like the Rosen. Put them on a poster. All the way up in the sky where the stars posted Sip it on that rose, I put it down on coasters Stack francs from the waves till I own the ocean More praises for the sayings, let it all soak in They like, hey, that shit is flame, bitch, I know I roll They going tight Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel This is Abby with Abby Reviews And of course, this is going to be my retro review Of The Wire, Season 1, Episode 4 Old Cases So, uh, we start with Herc and Carver trying to get this desk into the building. So to get the, well, Herc trying to get the desk in. And he is, I don't know why he's pushing, but he's pushing the desk. I don't know if he's trying to get, I don't know what he's trying to do. So all of the men come to help him. Lieutenant Daniels comes to help on one side. Herc and Signor go on the other side. They're trying to go. Now, here's the only problem. And Lieutenant Freeman saw this immediately. They're both pushing in the opposite direction. They're both pushing in and the desk is not moving. Of course not moving because you're pushing on one side and they're pushing on the other side. You need one side to be pulling and the other side to be pushing to get it through the door. Man, man, listen. All right, so eventually they stop and he's like, at this, and Herc says at this point, we're never gonna get it in. And he said, in? Everybody says, you're trying to get it in and not push it out? And they get pissed off and walk away. <laughs> so we did in court with Kima and McNulty. And they're trying to get one of the people caught up in the raid to flip onto any of the upper people. Um, Daniel goes, D Lieutenant Daniels goes to visit the older white cop who got hit by Bodie. Um, and he says his shoulder is broken and he's going out on medical and that's it. He's done. He's retiring. Um, McNul we go back to McNulty and Kima as they try. And like I said, they were trying to flip one of the young men who got caught up in the raid. And they said, uh, you going to do either you flip and give us some names or you're going to do the five years for the charge. And he was like, I'll take the five years. I'm not flipping. I'm not a snitch. That's not what's happening. I'll just take the five years. And they both look at each other and they're like, damn. So, um, Bodie is in juvie and he talks to the guy and the guy says, you know, change your clothes and then you, this is your bunk that you're staying in. And Bodie says, is there any other East Side guys here? And he was like, no, most is DC boys and somewhere else. And Bodie's like, okay, I'm going to have to get out. And everybody's looking at him like, we're going to whoop your ass. So Bodie gets a mop bucket and uses the mop bucket to shuffle himself to the front door. Nobody's paying attention to him. And he walks out. He just walks right out the damn door. Just out. I'm out. Now, and nobody says anything. Nobody's paying attention to him. He just walks out the door. Um, Herc and Carver are on their way to Juvie to see Bodie to see if they can get him to flip. But at this point, Judy has, Judy, Bodie has already left and he's trying to hitchhike his way back to Baltimore because he said, this shit is for the birds. They can't hold me. I'm not doing this. Um, so McNulty and Bunk are talking about how no one had flipped and they're going through murder cases to see if any of them have connections to Barksdale or a Barksdale crew member or something. They're trying to build their case and add bodies and, and to, uh, to significantly bring him down. So the lieutenant says they got a case and um, it may be connected to D'Angelo Barksdale because there was a informant who said that she had been visited by somebody named D. Um, and they're like, no, that doesn't really have any connection. And he was like, you just take it on anyway and see if it fits into what we got going on. So 
they uh McNulty's uh partner Santangelo who's supposed to be on the detail with him the Barksdale detail has been missing all of the time no he's nowhere to be found and McNulty keeps covering for him even though he has no idea where this man is um so they get the file the murder file and they see that there was a um a witness on there and there was a phone number who said and she's the and that witness is the one who said that d the girl had seen somebody named d and so they call it and the number is no longer in service and he says well let me call the phone company and see if we could get if that number's disconnected was it changed to a different number or what happened see if they can get in contact with whoever's number that was um Kima is driving bubbles around and she tells him and he tells her about Omar robbing the stash. Um, Omar and his crew are talking about the next caper. Um, this young girl named Shirley, who has she's like maybe 16, 17 at the most, and she comes with her baby and she comes up to Omar and she's like, Mr. Omar, my check is late. And She's like, he, and he's like, okay. And he, I guess he has a soft spot for her because she has a baby. So he gives her free drugs. Um, and we then see oh, that the fact that Omar is gay because he, you see him being affectionate with his boyfriend who is part of his crew. Um, so Kima and Bubbles are talking about Omar and... He's like, yeah, Omar name rings out because his, his brother was No Heart Anthony. And Kima was like, No Heart Anthony, who is that? And he was like, listen, how you don't know your Baltimore history? Um, how you don't know No Heart Anthony? He's like, at this point, I am embarrassed to be your snitch. I said, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so um, Kima has to do something. And so she sends bubbles with um, McNulty. And so McDon and when Bubbles get in the car with McNulty while he's still talking to Kima, he's like, McNulty, you know who No Heart Anthony is? And he said, you mean Anthony Little, date of birth, blah, 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 blah. Used to live at such and such and such address. Is now up in county serving such and such years for a robbery. That No Heart Anthony? And Bubbles says, see? See? Know your history. <laughs> so... Um, we then go to the gym and where Bart and where Avon and Stringer Bell and Weebay and them are all at the, and they're talking about the stash getting robbed. And they say it's Omar who robbed the stash and they talk about how Omar is gay. And so Bar Avon says, I'm putting a deuce on, which is two grand on, um, Omar and it's double that if you bring if I get to see him before he y'all do him so there's now an active hit out on Omar and his crew um Omar and Stringer Bell I mean Avon and Stringer Bell have talk about D'Angelo and they talk about first the stash gets robbed and then the cops raid him and it was like um uh, there's a problem in the low rises and he's like, and how's my nephew? And he's like, your nephew is running it and he's bringing in the money, but he may have a problem that he doesn't know about. Like there may be a snitch that he's unaware of that's telling their business. So, um, McNulty goes to his kid's soccer game and he still has bubbles with him. He's like, listen, I got something that I have to do right now. You're going to have to come with me. And when we're done, I'll drop you off. And so the thing that he has to do is go to his son's soccer game. And so you brought your heroin addict CI with you to the soccer game. And a history of bad decisions. That just seems sad. And so he has words with his ex-wife. They're still fighting over custody. McNulty would like more visitation with his kids. And she's like, I'm not giving up no more weekends. It, as it is, you halfway do what you're supposed to do, so no. So, Bodie arrives at the low rises because he stole a car to get there. Nobody was going to pick him up and hit check him. He had a screwdriver in his head. He stole a car. And...
Bodhi is talking about how um, the juvie can't hold him and stuff. And and D'Angelo said, um, it's juvenile hall. It's not, it's a cakewalk. He was like, you ain't even been to real jail. He was like, you ain't even had no bodies on you. He's like, I've been to jail. I stayed up upstate for eight months while I was on trial for that murder. He was like, but you got off though. He was like, you don't understand. That's not the only body that I have on me. And then he tells the story of how he killed one of his, uh, he put his uncle had him kill one of his ex-girlfriends because the girl found out that he was fucking around with a bunch of different girls. And so she said she was going to call the police and tell all his business. So... <coughs> He sent his uh, nephew over there and he killed her. Put a pin in that because we're going to come back to that in a minute. So, um, while they tell that story, Bodhi is looking at D'Angelo with new respect and they seem to come to some kind of understanding. Um, Rawls is talking about some refrigeration unit that went out in the lab and so now a bunch of murders and drug cases are now thrown out because all of the evidence has been ruined. And he's talking to the judge about that. And the judge is trying to get him some funding to get new things. And then they ask about, he asked about the Barksdale's case. And he's like, what's happening? What's going on? And he tries to give him a little half-hearted rundown. And the judge is not, is not satisfied. Um, Herc and Carver go to Bodie's grandmother's house to look for him. Because, you know, he's supposed to be at juvie, but he's gone. So, they first of all, they come banging on the door like crazy people. They screaming, open the fucking door, open the fucking door, you know. And they cussing at her, and they done threw all her stuff around the house. And she's like, he's not here. He doesn't come here. And then uh, Bodie sits down and have a conversation. Not Bodie, but Carver. Not Carver. Herc sits down and have a conversation with the grandmother. And while... Um, Carver is outside with the other cops that they use to kick in the door. And Herc ends up, he, he she sees that the grandmother has nothing to do with this. And he doesn't come by her house anymore. And so he apologizes for how they acted. Because they showed their ass in this woman's house. And it was unnecessary. Um, He gives her, her his card. He apologizes for how they acted. He gives her a card and says, if Preston comes by, which is Bodie's real name is Preston. If Preston comes by, give him this card and tell him we're looking for him. Um, so, the judge calls McNulty. Um, and he goes to see the major um, at the murder, um, at the homicide department. Um, let's see. Hold on, my eyes are starting to run together. So, uh, Kima is studying for her test, and Maj the Major and Daniels, Burrell, Major Burrell and Daniels are talking about what needs to happen next on the detail. Now, Freeman, Lieutenant Freeman, Detective Freeman sees the crew throwing rocks at the camera, and because uh, he's in the low rises and he's watching them. So then he, the number that he wrote on the wall when they raided the stash house that was empty, he calls that number off his cell phone and it's D'Angelo's pager. And he sees D'Angelo gets a page and then D'Angelo goes to the pay phone and then calls his cell phone. And that's how he knows it's D'Angelo's um, pager number. So, um... McNulty and Kima are trying to get a warrant to clone a pager and they discuss Omar and trying to catch him with his gun and maybe get him to flip um, info about Barksdale to get off the gun charge. Now, the other old white cop is drunk as Kuda Brown and he almost falls down the stairs trying to get to back to the office. Kima and, and McNulty just walk right past him because he's trying to play it off like he's cool, but he is drunk as Kuda Brown. So... Um, they're talking to Freeman about what they have to do to clone the pager or get a wiretap and they have to prove exhaustion. Like they fought, there's no other way they can follow him. They lose him in the high rises. They need, in order to effectively prosecute this case, they, they have to prove that they've done every other means with which to do, to follow him and is unsuccessful in order to clone his pager or get a wiretap. Um... 
and Lieutenant Daniel said, like, well, do we have his pager number? And that's when Lieutenant Freeman comes in and says, yes, we do. And this is the number. And he's like, how, he's like, what you want to do is put surveillance on every pay phone in the low rises. And he explains how he called, he paged that he got the number off the wall next to the name letter D in the stash house. And then he called it and D'Angelo called him back. And then, uh, McNulty begins looking at Freeman with respect. Um, and McNulty asks Bunk about, um, McNulty asks Bunk about Freeman and Freeman tells him he's natural police. Um, and he was like, well, how did he get stuck in the pawn shop department? And he said, being, you have to ask him. You just have to ask him. So, McNulty and Bunk go to investigate the crime scene of where the young girl got shot that the lieutenant said was the um, case um, that was connected to Barksdale. And thus begins the one of the greatest acted. It's not necessarily the writing because it's just one word that they use over and over again. But between McNulty and Bunk acting and playing off each other, one of the greatest scenes in this whole series where they have a, an entire conversation. And I have a friend that I do this with all the time um, using only one word. They only use the word fuck. And the different variations of fuck it and fuck my life and oh, fuck me and fuck and fuckity fuck, fuck, fuck. And, you know, they only use the word fuck and its variations and to come to the conclusion of that someone was standing outside that young lady's window and shot her from outside. So, and they find the bullet in the fridge, still in the fridge and the shell casing out in the yard. So, Kima and the crew are doing a detail of uh, D'Angelo to prove the exhaustion that they can they can follow him and keep losing him and following and keep losing him. McNulty takes uh, Free Lieutenant Fre Detective Freeman for a drink to figure out why he is hiding in Pond, and Freeman tells the story of a uh, murder case that he caught. Somebody got stabbed up. And it was the fence that he needed to make the case because the fence had all of the stolen stuff from the person who was murdered and could speak to who sold him this stuff. And apparently the fence had a big pool with some newspaper person who then had pool with the police department. And so they were like, make your case without the fence. And Lieutenant Freeman said no and subpoenaed him and made him testify. And they asked him, where did he, he got the conviction, but they asked him, where did he want to go? He was like, I don't care as long as I'm out in the sunshine, give me a, a foot route. He, he was like, you know, I'll make cases on, on a foot patrol, you know, as long as I'm outside. And they asked him, what don't you want to do? I said, don't put me in no office shit, no paper pushing shit. I don't want to do that shit. So, of course, they sent him to the pond to punish him for not doing what they told him to do. They sent him to the pond unit. Um, to that's where he was to languish after he was punished and then Lester warns McNulty when they come to ask you where you want to go when this is over don't say anything don't give them ammunition don't say anything um, McNulty comes by to see Kima for relatively no reason. I guess he's just lonely and he thinks Kima's his friend. But Kima is really like, what the fuck? Why are you? Bruh, what's going on? What's happening? Mm -hmm, no, sir. And then she, and she, after she sends McNulty on her way, she and her girlfriend get steamy. And that's how the episode ends. This is another great episode. Um, again, there are no, um, there are not really any, though it may feel like a filler, not many episodes are filler in this series because everything means something. Every detail means something. Like at the beginning when the lieutenant stuck that case on him saying that maybe it, and then for them to come to the conclusion. And then this case is going to play a part later on down the line when the big bust happened. So, you know, everything in this 
series, every episode, there are details that mean something in the greater story of telling of this whole situation. So that is my review for The Wire season one, episode four. Um, please like, comment, and subscribe. Get down in the comments. Tell me, did you, first of all, that scene where they just said fuck to each other is amazing. It is amazing acting. Uh, amazing. Top notch, top tier. Please, let's get in the comments. Let's talk about it. Like, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a kin. And we will catch you in the next one. Peace. I said we like it's not just me. Y'all know what I mean.